morning, uh, and uh, thank you, Pierre Paolo, for this uh, introduction, also for the invitation. And uh, I think what I'll try to do um, in hopefully 30 minutes is actually expand on some of the things that have already been put on the table. Um, so, of course, the Antwerp, um, the topic of uh, our talks today, uh, is a landmark publication. It was largely complete, as we know, in 1712, finally published in 17, 1721. And uh, as we also know, it has spawned an enormous bibliography, uh, uh, an enormous amount of research about how it came into being, why it was made, who made it, uh, what its purpose and aim is, which somehow, I think, amounts to the question of how we can read it. Um, my approach to the question of how to read it is, you could say, structured around a twofold hypothesis, which in itself, each of the legs has its own two legs uh, in, uh, uh, of itself. So the first hypothesis is that the Entwurf is an attempt to reclaim the value of historical architecture uh, as a point of reference for contemporary practice. I recognize that this point is not particularly original, but I hope uh, that I can develop it a little bit. So I read the Antwerp as an essay in architecture that is historical, on an architecture that is embedded in history, and as such contingent, subject to change and transformation. And it is as such that it becomes a source of invention. And the second part of this first hypothesis is that this claim is made in the face of a previous very powerful rejection of the value of historical architecture as a legitimate point of reference. A rejection that was equally, equally, equally rooted in the discovery or the acknowledgement of the historicity of architecture. And so the, this, this rejection of uh, historical architecture as a valid point of reference because of its historicity is something that happens in France in the second half of the 17th century and that I think is basically a point of reference for um, uh, the Antwerp. The second hypothesis is that you could say the reactivation or readmission of history is operated by extending its geographical scope. So I read the extension of the geographical uh, scope of the Antwerp as a strategy to reactivate history. So the global dimension of the Antwerp serves to validate the richness and fecundity of historical architecture, yeah, of its historicity as a source of invention. And then the second part of that second hypothesis is that the medium of this expansion uh, and of the reactivation of history is the compendium of the printed image. It's been very well established, and I mean, here we can think of the work of Marco Folin and uh, Monica Preti, that the Antwerp is not the account of Fischer's uh, personal encounter with a body of buildings, but a curated collection of printed images, which have been redrawn, arranged, and taken from other sources, as well as his own work. And I think it's crucial to keep in mind that this is a, future, uh, a feature that the Antwerp shares with many printed compendia of its day and age, and Pierre Polo re referred to Picard, but I mean, there's a whole range of printed material that actually uses the exact same strategy. And the Antwerp somehow explores or exploits this freedom that is afforded uh, by the printed uh, compendium, with the aim to demonstrate the opulence of an architecture that is uh, historical. So the actual site of invention of an architecture that is uh, histor uh, historical is the printed uh, page. Now, so in order to sort of develop what I just said, I will proceed as follows. So first I will explore how in the second half of the 17th century, the acknowledgement of architecture's uh, historicity led to a complete disavowal of historical architecture as a legitimate point of reference for practice. And I will uh, uh, develop that point by discussing, perhaps in slightly too much detail, uh, the Parallèle de l'Architecture Antique avec la Moderne uh, by uh, Fréard de Chambre, published in 1650, and which I think is, you could say, 
the point of reference uh, for every subsequent discussion about it. Uh, then I will move to the Entwurf. So first I will examine its own claims by, have a, by having a closer look at the preface, the Vorrede, and then by looking at how it actually reuses images, by looking at one single example, which was already shown, uh, the, uh, the plate on the architecture of Siam. And then, uh, almost inevitably, I will have to go to Logier, uh, as, a, as a point of contrast, of course, uh, as was already uh, put on the table by Pierre Paolo. So, let's start with uh, Frère de Chambre and the Parallel d'Architecture Antique avec la Moderne, as published in 1650. And as a way of entering the book, I propose to look at uh, how it presents the Column of Trajan. Frère's discussion of the Column of Trajan is as a rare, nearly intact specimen of the Tuscan uh, order. Uh, Friar explains the origin of the column by means of its function. Uh, it was erected by the Senate in order of Trajan, an emperor, and because uh, it wanted to honor a Roman emperor, it was decided to employ not a Greek, uh, but a Roman order, the Tuscan, even though the Tuscan was until then only used for, and I quote Friar, coarse and rustic things. In fact, uh, Friar argues the Romans, with, with the column, the Romans endeavored to show that they could fashion magnificence from even such simple matter by engraving the story of Trajan's contest in the richest style imaginable. And he says, and I quote, architecture became the historiographer of this new kind of history, end of quote. But perhaps the most marvelous thing of all, he continues, is that this column is still standing. And I quote again, all entire amidst an infinity of uh, rooms with which Rome is filled. It is like a wonder to see how the Colosseum, the theater of Marcellus, the great circuses, the terms of Diocletian, Caracalla and Antonine, this superb mass of the tomb of Hadrian, the Septizonium of Severus, the mausoleum of Augustus, and so many other buildings that seem to have been built for eternity are no, now so obsolete and dilapidated that one barely distinguishes their form. That's what Friar writes. So this assessment of the column, uh, so I propose, belongs to a key historical moment, moment in the appreciation and representation of historical architecture. A moment marked by a fundamental distrust of historical remains, as they are by definition incomplete and fragmented, a distrust to use these as a valid point of reference for artistic and architectural theory and practice. And Friar, in a way, uh, uh, suggests uh, as much. Actually, so obviously, this is the this, are, this is the history that's been written. Yeah? Um, he suggests as much, and the value of Trajan's column resists in its wholeness, in the fact that you could say it has somehow escaped history, which stands in a marked contrast with the rooms surrounding it, whose original and true appearance is lost for good. So the column is celebrated as an exception to an otherwise problematic situation, the room of Roman architecture. Now, by making this point, Friar marks the onset of a process by which the value of the buildings of antiquity for architectural theory and practice became a matter of contention. Since the Renaissance, these buildings, uh, mainly known uh, through the ruins of Rome, had been treated, treated as authorities on a par with or even above Vitruvius' ten books of architecture when it came to defining the principles of architecture. And this idea was, of course, a commonplace in Renaissance architectural theory. And very famously, in the introduction to book six of his De Redificatoria, Leon uh, Battista Alberti wrote that, uh, and I quote, examples of ancient temples and theaters have survived that may teach us as much as any professor, end of quote. And he makes it abundantly clear that these ancient buildings provide far better guidance in understanding the principles of architecture than Vitruvius' text, 
which he famously derided as an incomprehensible wreck. And so Albechti writes, no building of the ancients that had attracted praise, wherever it might be, but I immediately examined it carefully to see what I could learn from it, end of quote. And then he explains you know, how careful measurement of the runes allowed him to understand the principles of Roman architecture, which he then endeavored to write down in a clear and systematic way. Still, he also notes that, and I quote again, I see, not without sorrow, these very buildings being despoiled more each day, end of quote. Recognizing the value of ancient runes and tales facing the drama of their loss, due both, both to the vagaries of time and to the actions of the present. And this dual appreciation of Roman runes by architects as lodestones for guidance, but also as objects mourned for their uh, disappearance, finds a poignant expression in the famous letter of Raphael to Leo X, where uh, Raphael states, uh, I, Raphael, have been so completely taken up by these antiquities, not only in making every effort to consider them in great detail and measure them carefully, but also in assiduously reading the best authors and comparing the built works with the writings of those authors. And I think that I have managed to acquire a certain understanding of the ancient way of architecture. And this is something that gives me simultaneously enormous pleasure yeah? from the intellectual appreciation of such excellent matter and extreme pain at the sight of what you could almost call the corpse yeah, of this great noble city, one screen of the world now so cruelly butchered. And then this observation introduces the famous project of the letter, yeah, the project of reconstruction, yeah, which proposes to measure all major monuments of ancient Rome and draw their original appearance. Yeah. So drawing, or you could say visualization, is uh, the instrument uh, for the recovery of a lost example. And you could say that's the core of the project of, uh, of, the, of the letter. So by proposing that project, Raphael postulates a meaningful relationship between historical remains, the acts of measuring, recording, and visualizing, the principles of architecture, and the memory of Rome. Rooms and the visualization of their original state are key vehicles for uh, a process of imitation and emulation, establishing a crucial and essential link between contemporary practice and lost models. Now, exactly this system is at stake with uh, Frère de Chambray. As the title, uh, Parallèle d'Architecture Antique avec la Moderne, indicates, the work is essentially a set of comparisons not just of ancient with modern architecture, but also of modern architects uh, amongst each other, with Palladio Scamozzi, Seglio Vignola as chief examples, but he selects uh, a body of 10 architects. The parallel focuses entirely on the five architectural orders, first the three Greek orders, and then the Roman counterparts, so Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Tuscan, and Composite. Always by first giving one or more examples uh, of each order, as, fine, as found in ancient, mainly Roman buildings. So I hope you can see that a little bit. That's why I gave this overview. So you have a fixed uh, sequence. These are his three historical examples of the Doric order. Then you have uh, the Doric order of 10 modern authors with back-to-back -back comparison. And then you have a single building where the Doric order is uh, applied. And so it's in this logic that he shows the, 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 Trajan, the column of Trajan yeah, as a, an example of the application of the Tuscan. Now, the intention here is obvious. The comparisons demonstrate that none of the canonical authors gives the same measures and proportions for any of the orders, and that none of these various models, in turn, corresponds exactly with an ancient model, and that none of the ancient examples is identical to another. Now, this visual celebration of the discrepancies between every attempt to transform the rooms of antiquity into a normalized design system did not dismiss the authority of historical precedent. Actually, quite to the contrary. But Freyach still sees in these discrepancies the seed of corruption. It opens the door towards the unwarranted license that, in his view, characterizes the work of so many modern architects and artisans. 
So it is in order to contain this risk that the parallel is extremely selective in the set of examples it provides. And this set, Friar argues, and he's very explicit about that, is the object of a consensus, of an agreement amongst professionals, a shared appreciation for the intrinsic qualities of these examples, old and new alike, and it is only in, within this set of examples that architects can exercise their judgment. Uh, a sp within this space, you could say, shaped by a professional consensus. And there only is there room for architectural inventions, uh, invention. Now, this approach establishes new oppositions between architecture and historical models. The operation of lifting ancient and modern models on a similar plane, where they become the subject of comparison, of a parallel, impl implies, of course, a very careful addition of both set of samples, so as to make them commensurate and equally complete, but also self-contained and clear. And the same is true uh, for the limited set of buildings that Freyag uses to illustrate his purpose. For the Corinthian order, for instance, Freyag uses an altar adicule in the Pantheon, and the altar, which you see here on the left, is shown in isolation, complete, and entirely denuded of all reference to the polychromic revetment of the surrounding walls. So there is actually a very elaborate revetment which is still in place uh, around, these, um, uh, around these altars. Now, Friac's ex uh, explanation of the plate, which you can see on the right, suggests how the strategy of representation fits the general purpose of his treatise. Friac contrasts in the simplicity of his Corinthian example to contemporary fashion. And I just uh, translate the first three lines of this uh, uh, long text. Now it is some kind of fashion, or rather a universal mania, to esteem beautiful only that which is filled and stuffed with ornaments of all kinds, without choice, without discretion, without convenience, convenience nor for the work or for the subject. And then he goes on that uh, basically uh, architects are only satisfied to use Corinthian order if they double the columns, break up the pediments, and so on and so forth. And so when you start visualizing what he is so upset about, you immediately see in uh, the work of uh, people like Bernini, those who took off were basically uh, 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 Michelangelo left. And Friac describes this fashion as a form of endless multipl multiplication and ultimately mutilation. And against this process, uh, he contrasts the, uh, his purified set of examples. And Ultimately, Friag actually argues that even these examples are somehow uh, impure. Uh, in, in his introduction, he uh, finally invites the reader to look beyond uh, these examples, to look beyond the rooms and their reconstruction, to go to what he calls les sources de l'architecture, which is, in his view, uh, uh, Greek architecture and its three orders. Three orders which he writes are lost in their original, original purity, yet still perceptible through the filter of their inferior Roman and modern Im, uh, imitation. So, what I think you see in Friar's reasonings about uh, this relationship between uh, historical models and uh, architectural design is first, you could say, a kind of dynamic of, uh, between multiplication which is associated with corruption versus unification, and which is associated with an idea of original purity. And in that dynamic, uh, historical examples play a very ambiguous role. They carry the seed of corruption. They're actually, the, you could say, the material uh, uh, testimonies of a process of corruption. But at the same time, they are the only points of access to this ideal single source. And this ambiguity calls for a, uh, a process of selection and consensus, which is governed by uh, a professional elite. As a consequence, of course, uh, the idea that the whole body of the architecture of antiquity uh, as such can offer discrete and precise guidance for design is completely abandoned. And very briefly, I think it's uh, necessary to point out that something very similar happens in almost, I mean, a little bit later, but very much in the wake of Friar, uh, in the writings of that seemingly most modern of moderns, uh, Claude Perrault, who, as we know, embraces uh, the historicity of architecture. Uh, 
since he argues that aesthetic preferences and that what is deemed good architecture is determined by a consensus that changes over time. And so if, uh, if actually, there, there's actually one original point of, uh, of, of, of beauty, Perrault acknowledges also the historicity uh, of taste and consensus. And the force that shapes consensus, according to Perrault, is authority. An authority that, authority that can be, you could say, professional, as in the case of Vitruvius, or uh, political, uh, like the king and his uh, court. And as is well known, this is what Perrault calls the arbitrary aspect of beauty, uh, as it is subjected to the arbitration uh, of an uh, uh, authority. Now, this position, and uh, this, you could say, fundamental acknowledgement of the historicity, not just of architecture, but also of taste, has the exact same effect on the validity of historical models for architectural design practice as Friar's quest for an ideal purity. Because historical models are arbitrary, as they literally belong to an other time or context, they have no validity as models for architectural design or invention in the present whatsoever. Indeed, and Peru is very explicit about it, any recourse to such historical models would be misguided as either it would embrace an invalid authority or authorize the arbitrary. And uh, as a kind of consequence of that, of course, uh, Pego proposes a system of proportion that is completely disconnected from any precise historical reference, but is purely mathematical, uh, which is, an, an, uh, uh, you could say, a, a complete, uh, a completely an intellectual construct as opposed to an archaeological one. Now, this brings us uh, finally, to um, <coughs> Fischer. Uh, Fischer van Erlach and the circles around him were, uh, I'm pretty sure, very well aware of, of what Freyer had written, uh, probably through Jean Pietro Bellori and so on. Uh, and Perrault, on the other hand, is very explicitly uh, present in the Entwurf, uh, in the preface to the reader. Uh, there, uh, Fischer, or Hegeus, um, adduces the distinction between arbitrary and objective beauty that I just discussed um, as, you could say, a critical factor in the composition of his uh, book. So, Fischer writes uh, in the introduction that his collection of images uh, allows all who want to exercise themselves in design, and I quote, and it's a quote that is on the, on the slide, to hold the taste of various kinds of countries against each other and to select the best, hereby recognizing that in building, often something depends on a habit without rules, end of quote. And this is, of course, exactly what Pegot described as arbitrary beauty. It is an aesthetic pleasure, a taste, that is not caused by rational or natural factors, but by conventions sanctioned and authorized by habit. These conventions do not depend on rational principles, but only on the same kind of customs, habits, that govern also fashion, but also the national cuisine. And that's also a, a reference that uh, Fisher uses. Still, Fischer continues, there are gewisse allgemeine Grundsachen, eh? which only a fool would deny, and then he gives Perrault's enumeration of objective causes of beauty. Eh? Uh, the first being symmetry, which probably you can't really make out. So here. Uh, symmetry, logical construction, size, precision of execution, so craftsmanship. So, however different the ways of building are that one encounters across the world, these qualities will always please, and use the word gefallen. Now, I just argued, or I tried to show, that exactly this distinction between, or you could say the acknowledgement of the arbitrariness of a certain the judgments, aesthetic judgment, allowed Perrault to dismiss the value of historical precedent. So, how does Fischer turn that around. First of all, uh, I think part of the answer sits in the quote. The arbitrariness of architecture supports and sustains the exercise of drawing and by extension invention. 
the different tastes that you encounter will teach you an endless variety rooted both in custom, yeah, so in uh, what is customary in certain nations or in certain times, but also in some constant principles, which very much have to do with the monumental in a way. And this dynamic then amounts to what I think is the stated purpose of the Entwurf, yeah? to provide visual representations that supersede verbal or written historical accounts, and now I quote again, to allow the eyes to seek counsel in images yeah, as a means of triggering or initiating thought. Yeah, and here uh, uh, Fischer uh, use, uses Gedachnis. So where do these images come from? What are they? According to Fischer, obviously these images are truth, yeah, Wahrheit. And then to define what truth is and how we know it, uh, he compares buildings to the people of the past. And now I'm paraphrasing what is in there. Huh? We know the deeds of the people of the past through wit written histories or inscriptions on tombs. We know their likeness through portraits on medals. And finally, he writes, we can look at their skeletons to make a conjecture about their nature and size. Now, of course, Fischer claims to use reliable sources uh, and to employ dependable methods. Uh, so he makes fun of previous versions of the seven wonders of architecture because they, uh, he says, they only share with the seven wonders their name. Yeah? He also promises to his reader that he will mention his sources uh, as, as, he, uh, as when he uses Filalpando for uh, the temple in Jerusalem. But he also, and that I think is quite striking, explicitly renounces on redoing the work of Palladio, Seglio, Ligorio, and so on. Exactly the kind of authorities that were discussed by Freyard and uh, Perrault. And he explains this it as follows. He says, redoing this work would unnecessarily rep reproduce what has already been made with the same flesh. So this return to the analogy between building and human being um, and basically uh, states that these noble predecessors, Palladio, Seglio, and so on, have successfully done what Fischer hopes to achieve. So it should not be rehearsed, even though, he writes, it robs his book of ornaments. Then Fischer con contrasts this useful reproduction of rehearsal with the images he has included in the Entwurf. There, and he writes, I have limited my own invention strictly to what is authorized by my sources. He states, he admits that he invented, and I quote, whenever I had to be aware to please the eyes as much as the minds, end of quote. So what I think the preface does is to present the Entwurf as an exercise in visualization of object, objects that are mostly gone, or at the very least, invisible. This is, of course, a very paradoxical statement uh, as it pref prefaces a book which contains much buildings, both in Vienna and beyond, that are still there, that you could see, that did not have to be reconstructed or retrieved. So I think you can also turn the statement around and that, in a way, the, the, the Vorrede casts the buildings that he shows in uh, the Entwurf, as if they are historical reconstructions, that as if they are produced in the act of drawing and representing. And this, of course, emphasizes the de degree to which the Entwurf is a collection of representations that are mediated through other sources. And these representations, these visualizations, exemplify the act of invention in giving flesh, conjectural flesh, to skeletons and as such, appeal to the eye and the imagination and trigger further invention. And this process, finally, is enhanced by the inclusion of a great variety of forms of buildings from past and present, from local to global. And this variety demonstrates the dynamic interaction between customs, habits and absolutes. And at the same time, I think, it is also activated in this process of visualization, activated by the exclusion of exactly those canonical visualizations that were the staple of architectural uh, theory. So the process of historical reconstruction, eh, of visualization, uh, is 
presented as a model of architectural invention. Let me just skip this one. Now, as such, and this is my final point, um, as has been noted by Victor Chudi, the Entwurf is rooted in a century-long tradition where the printed page acts as a site of architectural invention. And this happened very often in works with a historical agenda, uh, archaeological books on Rome, or guidebooks. And of particular uh, importance in that tradition, and here I follow uh, Victor, Victor Chudi, uh, is Giacomo Lauro's Antique Urbi Splendor, uh, a collection of prints illustrating ancient Rome published in 1615, which, as uh, Chudi has shown, is an, an entirely fictional uh, ancient Rome, uh, uh, driven by uh, the need to circumvent copyright, uh, uh, the, the copyright of earlier images, logo, either invented new monuments or renamed existing ones. And this work, and again, I'm still following Chudi, uh, has a profound influence on Fischer van Eglach. So he incorporates images from logo as when he uh, 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 shows the reconstruction of the Temple of the Good Gods uh, bet in between two vases. But also, um, uh, you could say uh, Logo's fictional architecture uh, influences the, the practice of Fischer van Eglach uh, when the um, Temple of Honor and Virtue in the circle of the temple in two parts with an exedra and two columns is somehow uh, quoted in the Karlskirche, uh, especially, uh, of, of course, in its use of, these, uh, of the double columnar uh, motif. A motif that we know Fischer used throughout, uh, liberally throughout his career eh, for its obvious capacity to evoke the Habsburg double uh, uh, column. Now, if we compare uh, this, you could say, very free use uh, of the um, uh, monumental column to Freyag's view of the column, which we discussed earlier, where it serves as a perfect and singular example of the Tuscan order, uh, you can see, I think, uh, 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 how in the Entwurf, the column uh, is not, you could say, an artifact in its own right, but again, part uh, of an historic, part or element of a historical imagination, which is part of an ensemble, uh, of, an, uh, of a reconstruction of the forum, which uh, is different in form, uh, you could say, very similar in kind to the one Lohr uh, proposed in his Antique Urbi Splendor. So it is not uh, an example that is part of a design code, but an element of composition and invention, an image to stimulate the eye and the, um, uh, 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 the imagination. Now, what the Entwurf does uh, by uh, proposing uh, this kind of, you could say, uh, exercises in visualization is to participate or to become part of a large pool of images that circulated widely in Europe, in loose sheets, in compendia, in learned works, but also in popular publications such as guidebook. There was quite a lot of imagery of Roman antiquity going around, just like uh, images uh, of modern Rome. Huh? And what uh, Fischer does, huh? is to expand uh, uh, the pool of images uh, to which he turns his attention beyond Rome or Europe uh, by drawing on an increasingly available representation of non-European buildings in reports from missionaries and travelers stimulated by trade and campaigns of conversion, which you could say amount to the visual record of the colonial enterprise. So what happens uh, in, in the Entwurf is that you could say this process of historical reconstruction as a model for architectural invention is enhanced and you could say activated by the addition of histories extending beyond the Greco-Roman narrative. And what I suggest is that this, that this is precisely because this Greco-Roman narrative has been framed as a quest for pure and rational principles that lie beyond uh, history. Yeah? So in a way, the Antwerp uh, uh, operates a kind of injection of new history into the realm of architectural uh, invention. So in that sense, and this is a point that Susan Babet has made, which I think is important, the history of the East, uh, of the architecture of the East, is not a prelude to the Greco-Roman history, but it's, it's cognate. Huh? Um, 
And there again, I think it's really interesting to, uh, to realize that uh, Fischer explicitly steps away from Palladio Salu and so on, uh, but moves to a body of images that is actually equally well known and equally available as these architectural treatises. So this whole idea that's saying, well, okay, these uh, Palladio Salu and on have given flesh uh, to antiquity, so I don't need to do it again, is actually as valid for the non-European architecture, but what he does is obviously pull this in a view of history as a source uh, of invention. So, I mean, this is just a little pointer, and the Entwurf operates like near contemporary publications, so as the Galerie Agréable du Monde uh, by uh, Pieter van der Aar, published in Leiden, which are a compendium of existing images of often heterogeneous sources uh, classed under geographical headings. And it's adopting this strategy that gives visual substance to the relativist claims of people like Claude Perrault, while emphasizing a contemporaneity. Now, what this yields uh, can be explored brief, briefly with one example, uh, which I will uh, try to show you quite click, uh, quickly. Uh, the image uh, intended to represent the architecture of uh, Siam. Huh? As the, uh, the legend of the image uh, uh, says it shows in the, the fleet of ballons, the names of these boats, uh, that were sent out to pick up the French ambassador to visit King Fran Narai uh, outside of Ayat, uh, Ayat, uh, Ayutthaya. Now, the source of this image is well known, and it's also referenced, politely referenced by Fischer. It's the uh, account of the Voyage de Siam, uh, published by the Jesuit uh, Tachard but obviously with one uh, main uh, difference. Uh, there is uh, a building added here, so in Tashar there's no building, which is presented as the royal palace of uh, the king of Siam. Now, it's important again, what I want to emphasize is that Fischer transforms an emblematic and incredibly well-known image, which is part of visual cycles uh, about an important change of, uh, of events, uh, which is summarized here. Uh, which was a big part of the visual propaganda of Louis XIV, which is the reciprocal visit of the ambassadors of Siam to Versailles uh, in the Galerie des Glaces. Uh, and uh, in this depiction, uh, you see again uh, this image, which is taken from Tachard uh, as an indication of the prehistory. Um, this image itself uh, is very widely distributed, just like Tachard. Tachard was translated into Dutch and English almost immediately after publication in uh, 1685. And the illustrations are recut. This is a Dutch version of the same images. So these images are not obscure. And they are very much imbued with a strong French imperialist uh, message. They are also part of a big body of images, uh, uh, where, which actually contained pretty reliable uh, uh, documentation of the actual palace of, uh, uh, of the Siamese king. So what does... Uh, Fischer do? So how does he transform it? So how does he come to this edition? He basically uses another image that was um, part of uh, Tachar, which shows the Grand Pagoda um, of Siam, which you see here a little bit better in the recut image, and he actually combines uh, features of these two buildings uh, into this single uh, palace. Yeah? Um, so uh, you have the, the motif of the wall, the four obelisks, the centralized structure. Uh, but you can see that the roof is a little bit Europeanized. It almost looks like a Landkirche uh, 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 now. Uh, uh, also, uh, also the, the, the shapes around the buildings are now definitely obelisks. Uh, and by doing this, uh, there is now, you could say, a piece of architecture that makes present the King of Siam and is essentially fictional. But this fiction can actually be very easily verified if you just flip 50 pages further in Tashar, you can see uh, where uh, Fischer uh, uh, takes it from. Yeah? So, as such, the image itself is a kind of compendium within a compendium. Yeah? Proof of the capacity of history, so here understood as the important historical events of the recent past and present, to provide the material for architectural invention. And again, this history expands beyond Europe, and it is at such, as such that it maintains its fertility. Yeah, this is basic. This, so, so if you open your Tashar, you can understand where this comes from. 
So to conclude, and I'll be very brief, um, obviously the strongest dismissal of the relevance and legitimacy of history for the design of architecture was published three decades uh, after the Entwurf, the Essay sur l'architecture, um, where uh, in the famous frontispiece, Lady Architecture uh, leans her back on the remains of history to point to the primitive uh, hut. Uh, what I think is important to keep in mind is that uh, Loger very much sees history obviously as a continuous process of decline, which culminates in what he calls the invention of paper architecture, an architecture that exists only in uh, paper, eh? uh, architecture that presents stones uh, as paper works. Uh, so there is, uh, uh, I mean, this is definitely an attack against Rococo uh, architecture, but you can uh, playfully expand it eh? uh, to uh, Fischer. And uh, these ideas, I hope to have shown, uh, are stand actually in, an, in a direct lineage uh, with Friere, uh, uh, so where we have seen uh, uh, he basically uh, uh, cast architecture potentially as the historiographer of the new kind of history on the condition that it used the most pure examples of a particular order, in this case, uh, the Tuscan. Uh. What Fischer does, uh, in contrast, uh, is, I, uh, I hope to have suggested, is that history uh, in its printed page, pages on paper uh, became the visualization uh, of architecture. Thank you.